So two and a half years ago, I remember I was sitting back in the left of the, of the sanctuary, sanctuary here during a sermon, and I don't remember what the sermon was about. I was uh, minding my own business, and God just told me a change was coming. He didn't give me any details. All he said is a change is coming. And at the time, I was the Pennsylvania State Director for the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Things were going really well. I was hiring staff in different areas of the state, and uh, coaches and athletes were coming to know Christ. And one of the things that was, was really well for me is as fundraising. You know, it's a, it's a ministry position, so you rely on people donating. And I got to the point where we were doing ministry and people were donating, and so I didn't really have to put in too much effort into fundraising, which is a great position to be in. So the bottom line is I was really comfortable where I was at, and I really thought that I was going to be there for the rest of my career. But I'm sitting there, and now God's telling me that a change was coming. And so I go home, and I just start to pray about it, start to ask God, like, what's this change? What's going on? And he starts bringing these men into my life. And as these, as these men, I start to go out to lunch with them, and they're telling me they're struggling through divorce, they're struggling with their finances, and then also they're telling me that they just don't have anybody close to them that they could rely on, someone that they can go to uh, when they're struggling. And as I'm praying about this and, and talking to these guys, you know, I feel God just tell me, he's like, hey, I want you to do something about that. And I remember honestly thinking, like, God, I am not the guy. Like, I can't, these are, these are serious problems. I'm not the guy that's going to be able to help them through these things. And so I call a mentor of mine. He's in, he was in Pittsburgh, Bob Jamison. He runs a men's ministry in Pittsburgh. He's done all this before, and I just start talking to him, and we start praying together over a couple months, and still just, just really a struggle making this decision. And so he says to me, he says, hey, I want to take you to the Billy Graham Retreat Center. We're going to go there for three days. It's going to be a concentrated, focused prayer time on what God is asking you to do. So we go there, and we spend a couple days uh, talking to God, praying. He had me do a, read a couple books before I went, and uh, we're, we're going through those things. And I started to feel pretty confident about what God wanted me to do. And on the last day, we were supposed to go for a hike in the morning. And the night before, he just looks at me and he says, man, I don't, I don't feel good. He's like, I don't think I can go on this hike. He's like, well, I'm just going to sleep in. So no problem. You know, I can sleep in too. I'll just mess around until our flight leaves. Uh, but early that next morning, I wake up. It's not even light out yet. And I'm laying in bed. And all of a sudden, this fear and anxiety and just this intense feeling just came over me. It was like nothing I've ever felt before, and it just literally felt like someone was pressing down on me as I was laying in bed. And what that fear and that anxiety was is, like I said, I was comfortable. I was comfortable where I was at. You know, I, I, not much effort, fundraising, and all those things. And I remember, you know, like, God, you're asking me to step out in faith and start something that I don't really know a whole lot about. You haven't given me many details, and it's like, God, I just don't think I can do it. And... I was laying there in bed, and I literally told God, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to start this men's ministry. It can't be wrong to stay with FCA. i got lots of things going on. And it's like, God, it can't be wrong. I mean, I'm, I'm in ministry doing good things. I'm just going to stay here. And just looking back on that, it was the enemy's last-ditch effort to keep me from making that decision. I mean really feel like it was the enemy just pressing down on me with that fear and anxiety that he was putting in me at, in that moment. And so this morning, we're talking about struggle, and, you, and talk about a struggle in that moment. You know, God's asking me to leave what I'm comfortable doing and asking me to step out on faith. I didn't have, I didn't have a name for the ministry, didn't have very many details, and, you know, I was going to have to ask for money for people to give me money for something that I didn't even really know what I was doing. And so just thinking about all that, uh, you know, I was really going through a struggle. And we all go through struggles. You know, everyone in here is either gone through a struggle, you might be going through a struggle now, or you're going to face 
a struggle in the future. No one gets a free pass. Everyone goes through struggles. And for men, it can be even more difficult, right, men? Because we, we don't like to ask for help. We don't like to admit when we're struggling. And honestly, you know, like I was one of those guys. You know, I just would keep to myself and didn't like to admit when I was, when I was struggling. And culture likes to keep us there, too. Culture likes to tell us, hey, be a man, suck it up, and, and get through it. And that's, that's the enemy talking. The enemy wants to keep us separated. He tries to keep us from reaching out to others because he doesn't want us to have others around us. And so the truth is, is that we need other people around us. So I'm going to share a little bit this morning, um, and then I'm going to have two guys come out, and we're going to interview them for some struggles that they've gone through. And the neat thing uh, about these two guys is that, you know, God's put me through a lot to get me here to start the men's ministry. Uh, and the men's ministry has played a role in, in their struggle. So, you know, God, God has used the ministry. So if you'll open uh, your Bibles with me to Psalm 22, we're going to get into to God's word a little bit here. And I love this psalm for two reasons. Number one, David's going through a struggle here. It doesn't say what the struggle is or what he's going through, but he's go, he goes back and forth through this time of like feeling despair and putting his hope in God. And he does that a couple of times as you're reading down through this psalm. And so we can, all, we can all relate to that. We can all relate to where we put our hope in God, and then we go and we, and we struggle anyway. And then the second thing is that it reminds me that Jesus knows exactly what we're going through. Because if you look at the, the first words of this psalm, it says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And those are the same words that Jesus used when he was crucified on the cross. And so this, this psalm foreshadows what, what Jesus went through on the cross. If you look at what David goes through, he feels forsaken, he feels mocked by his enemies, and those are the same things that Jesus experienced. So no matter what I'm going through, nothing will ever compare to what Jesus did for you and me on the cross. And it's the reason we can, put his, we can put our hope in him. It's the reason we can put our trust in him. So Jesus died on the cross for our sins, and that is the message that I want you to hear this morning, and that's a message that we need to share with others. So as we get into Scripture, there's three things that we can learn from David as he goes through his struggle. And the first thing that we can learn is that God is there for you. And so I want to read the first five verses. And it says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. And you, our fathers, trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you, they trusted and were not put to shame. So how many times have you felt like this? You're going through a struggle, and you think about it all day, and at night you just want to rest, and you're laying there wide awake thinking about it some more. And it can be frustrating because you know that God can change it. You know God can change your circumstances. And I've done this many times in my life, you know, even going through that struggle of making that decision to start the ministry. You know, I would think about it all day, go to bed exhausted, and just lay there wide awake. And when I do that, oftentimes I picture God in the room with me because, I, like, he can be there, right? He's everywhere. And I picture God there, and I can even feel his presence. But again, it's frustrating because he's not giving me an answer. And I just lay there, just like David, and I'm asking why. Like, why, God, why aren't you answering me? But in verse 3, if you look at verse 3, David makes that shift in his thinking to where he puts his hope in God, and he says, yet you are holy. And he talks about how his fathers trusted him, or trusted them, for, and he remembers those things that, that, he, that God did for his father. And so David knows that God is there, he knows that he is listening, and he can trust him because of what he's done in the past. And the same thing applies for us. In our struggles, we have to remember those things. We have to remember what he's done in the past for us, what, he, what he's done in the past for others. And we just have to put our trust in him, even though he's being silent in the moment. And so the second thing uh, that we can learn from David is that God has a plan for you. 
And so let's read uh, the next couple verses here, verses uh, 6 through 11. And it says, But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by people. All who seek me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth, and from my, my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. So again, David goes back to this feeling where he's feeling in despair, and so he describes himself as a worm. So not only does he feel like God's not listening or God's ignoring him, he feels insignificant. And I know there might be some fishermen out there that think worms are pretty significant, but I can think you can agree that David is describing himself as pretty low, describing himself as a worm. And then in verses 7 and 8, he feels like others are laughing at him and they're mocking him because, because God's not answering him. Like he trusts in God, but God is not answering him. And then again... There's that foreshadowing of Jesus on the cross. When Jesus was on the cross, he was being mocked. He's literally God in the flesh. And he could step off that cross at any point in time, but he stayed on that cross for you and me to allow God to finish his work. So I don't know if I've ever felt like I've been mocked for my faith. Like, honestly, I don't know if anyone's ever made fun of me. Maybe I just didn't pay attention, I didn't realize it, or I just didn't care. But there have been times when I've questioned God. And it's those times when I'm struggling, I'm going through something, and I see someone who is not a Christian or they're not following their faith very well and things are going well for them. And so it gets tempting to think, like, why, is things, why are things going well for them and, and not for me? And then also in those times when you see a believer pass away unexpectedly or suffer for, through a disease, and again, you know, it's, it's tempting to think that that's not fair. Like, God, what are you doing? Why are your children suffering and these other people uh, are, are living a good life? And so I know those thoughts are from the enemy. And, you know, you just have to trust that God is there. Even through those tough times, he is working. So we look at verses 9 through 11. And David, again, makes that change in his thinking. He puts his hope in God despite his circumstances, and he says, Is you who took me from, are you are he who took me from the womb? So David knows that even from birth, God was there and God had a plan, and, and it's all a part of our, all a part of his plan. And so in our struggle, we have to know that God has a plan for us and he will guide us if we let him, despite our circumstances or despite what is going on. And when I look back at my life, you know, I can, I can really see how God used struggles in my life to guide me, to get me to where I am today. And I, you know, I think of one situation in particular when I was uh, playing basketball in high school, and you know, I, had, I had a really good career, and, and I had my plans for where I wanted to go. And God really narrowed it down for me. He narrowed it down to one school and basically said, hey, you are going here. And I wasn't happy about going to that school, and it was a struggle for me. But God was like, this is where you're going. This is where I need you. And uh, he got me where he wanted me to go. And looking back at that, I understand why he did those things, why he did what he did, wh why he directed my life where he wanted me to go, because he wanted me to start EC Men, and he knew I needed to be right where I was at to do that. And so the third thing that we can learn from David is that he knew God would accomplish his plan. So I'm going to jump ahead to the last 10 verses. We're not going to read them uh, for time. But these, these last 10 verses, if you read through them, it's all about praising God for what he's done. You know, David feels like he got his response, and you know, he feels like God's working, and he praises because he knows that what God's going to do in the future as well. And there's victory in these verses. So God wins in the end. I do want to read the last verse. If you look at verse 31 with me, it says, They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to the people yet unborn, that he has done it. And so I want to point out that last line. It says, he has done it. 
And this reminds me of Jesus' final words on the cross in John 19.30, where he says, it is finished. So Jesus accomplished what he came to do. And when you look at what he accomplished, you know, look at, if you look at our lives, we're born sinners and we're separated from God. And you know, he's, a, he's a holy God, he's perfect. He can't allow us into heaven. So someone had to pay that price for our sins. And Jesus came down on the cross He paid that price. He suffered, went through all that for you and me so that we could be with God in eternity. And our part really is to just believe in him and accept him. So I want to go back to that moment, that morning that I woke up at the Billy Graham Retreat Center. And I'm laying there, you know, I feel all this pressure, all this anxiety, and I'm telling God that I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to I'm not going to start this men's ministry. I had all that fear, anxiety, like I've never felt before, and it's just pressing down on me, and I'm, I'm laying there. So I decide to get up, and I grab my Bible, and I go outside, and I go to, if you've ever been to the Billy Graham Retreat Center, there's a, a big deck on the main building, and it overlooks the mountains. It's a really great view, but um, it, wasn't even, it wasn't even light out yet. And so I go out there, and I'm sitting in a chair, and uh, I had my Bible, and I had to use my phone, the light on my phone, to read my Bible because it was still, still dark out. And I'm sitting there reading my Bible, and I just sense God tell me to close my Bible and just set it to the side and just sit and listen. And so as I'm sitting there listening to God, the sun is actually starting to come up. And I hear God just give me these words or give me this thought. And he said, I didn't die on the cross for you to live in fear. And so, man, I I thought about that, and I was just like, wow, God, I I cannot argue with that. I think about what he did for me, and all he's asking me to do is start a men's ministry. He's asking me to leave comfort and and start a men's ministry, and and I couldn't couldn't compete with uh, him, him dying on the cross. And so at that moment, even though I didn't have a name, I didn't have details, I told God, I was like, I'll do it. I'll step out, and I'll start uh, the men's ministry. And God's, you know, been slowly, it's been two and a half years, and God's still slowly revealing to me what's going on, but he's given me victory along the way, and he's, he's used EC men, and he's used me to help other men going through struggle. And I've been able to share the gospel. There's been men come to know Christ, and so it's been, it's been a blessing there's been lots of up and ups and downs, I'm not going to lie to you. It hasn't been easy, and it's still a struggle. But I know that I wouldn't be here without God putting me through those struggles. And I know without a doubt that I would not have had the courage to start EC Men if I didn't go through those struggles. 